In history class, we hear about the Sumerians, the Babylonians, and the Hittites, but the languages the people of those ancient civilizations spoke are long dead. However, there are a few languages that have been spoken since ancient times, evolving and changing but not dying, some not even losing relevance for millennia. Think about that, parent to child speaking stages of the same language in a perfect chain for thousands of years. A lot of Americans can't even go back four generations without their ancestors speaking a different language. So let's find the top five oldest surviving languages. Number five, Latin and the Romance languages. The earliest attestations of Latin were in about 700 BCE, written in an adapted form of the Greek alphabet that would become the Latin alphabet. Old Latin was spoken in the city-states and tribal confederacies of Latium, including an irrelevant republic named Rome. Cut to three Punic Wars and at least one Julius Caesar later, and Rome had become a Mediterranean empire. By this time, Old Latin had become the classical Latin of Cicero and the vulgar Latin of the commoners. Rome hit a golden age with the so-called Five Good Emperors and then fell into the Year of the Five Emperors and Crisis of the Third Century, which resulted in Rome being split into East and West. Also, a guy died and Rome worships him now, laying the foundation for Latin to be the language of prayer to this dude in Western Europe. Then the barbarians did their thing and obliterated the Western Roman Empire in 476, and the language of the elite stopped being spoken as a first language. Meanwhile, Vulgar Latin diversified into the Romance languages. The Romance languages of Gaul became French and Occitan. The Romance speakers in Iberia spent a while reconquistaing, ending with Ferdinand of Castile and Isabella of Aragon uniting to form Spain, with Castilian becoming the national language, Spanish. Also, there's Portuguese and Catalan, but they don't matter. <laughs> Meanwhile, political control of Italy fragmented, as did the varieties of Romance. But then Dante wrote the Divine Comedy in his native Tuscan dialect, and the book was so popular that by the time the Kingdom of Italy united, it became the lingua franca of the whole peninsula and the Romance-speaking vampires in the East spoke a language that became Romanian. Meanwhile, classical Latin was preserved for academic and liturgical purposes. The Renaissance introduced a lot of Latin-based loanwords into the languages of Europe, as well as official terms for scientific, legal, and other fields. Also in the Renaissance, it became fashionable to Latinize your own name to make yourself sound more important. Latin was used in diplomatic settings until about the 17th century, and Spanish, Portuguese, and French became global languages because colonialism. Latin is still used as the official language of the Catholic Church and Vatican City. There is some level of mutual intelligibility between Romance languages, and less so with classical Latin itself, but nobody can understand French. Today, 900 million native speakers of Romance languages continue a history spanning about 2.7 thousand years. Number 4. Hebrew Records of what became Hebrew date back to 1800 BCE with the proto sinaitic alphabet which was used to write an ancient Semitic language. As the proto sinaitic alphabet spread and gained regional changes, so did the language itself, diverging into Hebrew, Phoenician, Aramaic, and other close relatives around 1000 BCE. Hebrew was the language of the Israelites, who began as a tribal confederation but eventually organized into a nation. They built a temple to their god in Jerusalem and began writing down their cultural stories, beliefs, and traditions in the 600s BCE. These writings were the beginnings of the Old Testament and were written in the Biblical Hebrew stage of the language. After an exile, a new temple, some Persians, and a few Maccabees, the Israelites, now called Jews, were subjugated by Rome as the province of Judea. The Jews rebelled against the Romans, who then destroyed the Second Temple and enslaved Jerusalem's Jews in 70 CE. Without their temple, there was pressure to preserve the oral tradition. So the first rabbis compiled the Talmud, which was written in the Mishnaic Hebrew stage of the language. Then, after another failed Jewish revolt, Emperor Hadrian committed genocide against the Jews, banned them from Jerusalem, and renamed Judea to Palestine. The Jews of Judea scattered and fled, and Hebrew died as a first language, becoming the Jewish academic and liturgical language in the diaspora. By 800, the main Jewish diaspora communities were the Ashkenazim, the Sephardim, both of which had their own golden ages, and the communities of the East, collectively called them as Rahim. Each community developed their own pronunciation of Hebrew. The state of the Hebrew language was basically the same until the 19th century, when the Zionist movement inspired Jews to return to Israel. But every group of Jews had a different first language. Yiddish for the Ashkenazim, Ladino for the Sephardim, Judeo-Arabic for a lot of Mizrahim, etc. The only language the emigrating Jews and the Jews who were already there had in common was their shared literary and liturgical language, Hebrew. Thus, Hebrew became the first and only language in history to have no native speakers and be revived. As for mutual intelligibility, since spelling has been frozen since the Mishnaic period, ancient texts are still somewhat understandable, but according to a friend who speaks Hebrew, the grammar is so different it's like Yoda wrote it. The Hebrew dialects that arose during the medieval period are currently being eclipsed by the Israeli dialect, 
but there seems to be about as much mutual intelligibility between them as with the Romance languages. Five million native speakers of Hebrew and millions more who know it as a second language or a liturgical language continue a history spanning over 3,000 years. Number three, Chinese. The earliest attestations of Chinese are inscribed on oracle bones for the purpose of divination, which date to the late Shang Dynasty in around 1200 BCE in a form of the language called Old Chinese. The Shang Dynasty was followed by the Zhou, and when that fell, the spring and autumn period, a period of division and instability, began. Despite that instability, the spring and autumn period saw the beginning of classical Chinese literature. Among these were the writings of Confucius, whose writings would go on to influence all future East Asian philosophy, Lao Tzu, whose teachings would go on to found Taoism, and Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, which influenced both the East and the West. After this period, the warring Chinese states were unified under the first Chinese emperor, Qin Shi Huang, but his dynasty fell after 15 years and gave way to the Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty was so influential that it became the namesake of the Han Chinese ethnic group as well as Han characters and the name of the language itself in Chinese. During the Han Dynasty, the economy boomed, Confucian principles influenced the government itself, paper was invented, Chinese influence spread, and the Silk Road was established, connecting the civilizations of the East to those of the West. After the Han Dynasty ended, centuries passed and dynasties rose and fell, including another Golden Age under the Tang Dynasty. Old Chinese became Middle Chinese, and China's surrounding nations were exposed to Buddhism and writing in the form of Han characters. In the 1270s, the Mongols, led by Genghis Khan's grandson Kublai Khan, took over the Song Dynasty, ending the Middle Chinese period. It was at this time that the Chinese dialects, besides Min, which had diverged earlier, began to evolve from Middle Chinese, which gave rise to Mandarin, Wu, Cantonese, and Hakka, among others. When the Republic of China was established in 1912, there was an effort to promote a national language, to unite the renewed nation for centuries to come. As you may expect, the language of the capital of Beijing was chosen, Mandarin. Since then, Mandarin has gained a level of prestige above the other Chinese languages, being used in education and media. Tens of millions of people still speak their regional language, but now Mandarin is a common second language used across the country. The fact that many consider Chinese as multiple related languages shows a level of mutual intelligibility. But different mutually unintelligible Chinese languages can read standard written Chinese and understand it because of its nature as a logography. Over 1.2 billion native speakers of Chinese languages continue a written history spanning about 3.2 thousand years. Number 2. Greek. The earliest attestations of Greek are written in the Linear B script around 1400 BCE in the Mycenaean period. But then the Bronze Age collapsed and Linear B was forgotten, and it was the Greek Dark Ages until the Phoenicians revived trade and spread their alphabet around. The Greeks relearned to write, and the ancient Greek period began. As the Greeks colonized the Mediterranean, they wrote down their myths and legends, like the Iliad and Odyssey, which might be based on a real war that probably had less divine meddling. The ancient Greek period had many dialects, such as the Doric dialects of Sparta, Corinth, and some islands, the Attic dialect of Athens, and the Ionian dialect of... Ionia. Starting in the 5th century, a golden age began as Athens became the center of cultural flourishing. The creations and ideas born by the great men of this era became the foundation of Western culture. Then, the Greek-adjacent kingdom of Macedon conquered the entire Greek mainland under Philip II and then Egypt and Persia under his son Alexander the Great. As Greek culture and language spread, a common or Koine form of Greek arose, based mainly on Attic. Koine Greek eventually became the only form of Greek and was written in the Septuagint and New Testament spoken by Cleopatra and after that became the second language of the Roman Empire. When Rome conquered the Greek world, Greek was already such an important lingua franca in the East that it became co-official with Latin. Then the empire split with the culturally Greek East centered on the new city of Constantinople. After the Latin West fell to the barbarians, Greek was now the only official language in Eastern Rome, uh, I mean the Byzantine Empire. This period of Greek was known as Medieval Greek. In the Medieval Greek period, the Byzantine Empire rose and declined, and by the Renaissance period, the empire was on the brink of collapse. Along with the revival of Latin terms and roots in the Renaissance, there was an increased use of Greek in science and math, some of which also bled into the vernacular. A few centuries after the Byzantine Empire fell, Greeks gained independence from the Ottomans and founded the modern country of Greece we know today, with modern Greek as the national language. Koine Greek seems to be somewhat understandable in writing to modern Greeks, but in older texts, understanding is reduced to picking out individual words. Also, the history of Greek has experienced a lot of vowel mergers, so spoken ancient Greek would be difficult to understand even without all the other changes over the millennia. Over 13.5 million native speakers of Greek continue a history spanning about 3.4 thousand years. Before I talk about number one, here are some honorable mentions. Why do I have honorable mentions? Because screw you, I wanted to talk about these languages too. You already got this far, so either you're watching this because I made you or because you're bored. You're watching this because you're interested? You really know how to make a faceless avatar smile even though he doesn't have a mouth. I digress. 
The first honorable mention is Persian. This one didn't make the list because the earliest attestation was too recent compared to the top five. Persian is first attested around a measly 525 BCE, a little after the beginning of the first Persian Empire founded by Cyrus the Great of the Achaemenid dynasty. It was written in cuneiform at first, though it was later written in Aramaic-derived scripts and then the Arabic script after the Islamic conquest. Persian remained a common spoken and prestige language throughout all the regimes to grace the Iranian plateau. 70 million native speakers of Persian continue a history spanning over two and a half thousand years. Next is Aramaic. This one didn't make the top five because the language is relatively insignificant today, especially related to the languages included in the list. The oldest roots of Aramaic also date back to proto sinaitic like Hebrew. In ancient times, Aramaic was the Middle Eastern lingua franca, widely used by the Neo-Assyrian, Neo-Babylonian, Achaemenid, and early Hellenistic empires, even becoming a second language to the Jews, being used in parts of the Bible and Talmud. After Arabic took over as the main language of the Middle East, Aramaic slowly died, now being mainly a liturgical language for Eastern churches and endangered as a native language. The remaining half million speakers of Aramaic continue a history spanning over 3,000 years. Lastly, there's the Egyptian language. This one didn't make the top five because it no longer has any native speakers, but damn, this one's interesting. The earliest attestations of ancient Egyptian was with the well-known Egyptian hieroglyphs around 3200 BCE, and was the language of ancient Egypt throughout the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms. When the Hellenistic Ptolemaic dynasty took over after Alexander the Great died, ancient Egyptian became Demotic, which was written in a cursive script called Hieratic. Demotic then later evolved into Coptic, written in a form of the Greek alphabet influenced by Hieratic. Nowadays, Coptic is just a liturgical language for the Coptic Orthodox Church. Coptic only died as a spoken language in the 19th century, meaning there are Egyptians speaking some form of the Egyptian language for around 5,000 years. Finally, here's first place. Sanskrit and the Indic languages. Officially called the Indo-Aryan languages, so that languages outside the family like Tamil aren't included, but I don't want to say Aryan any more than I have to, so I'm going with Indic. The earliest attestation of Sanskrit is around 1500 BCE with the Rig Veda, the oldest of the Vedas, which themselves are the oldest scriptures in Hinduism. This is a form of the language called Vedic Sanskrit. With the composition of the Vedas, the Vedic period began, where Vedism in the Northwest was worshipped alongside other related traditions like Shramana in the Northeast. Then the Indo-Gangetic plain began urbanizing and formed into 16 Mahajanapadas. Around this time, a the Shramana movement called Buddhism began challenging the Vedic orthodoxy in the West. Later, almost all of India was united under the Maurya Empire, and the Brahmi script, the ancestor of many writing systems in South and Southeast Asia, began. Many of the earliest Brahmi inscriptions were during the reign of Mauryan Emperor Ashoka, who promoted the spread of Buddhism across Asia. Due to increased pressure from Buddhism, Vedism, non-Buddha Shramana religions, and other Indian traditions synthesized into Hinduism. Eventually, Hinduism eclipsed Buddhism in India, and is now the world's third largest religion. Meanwhile, Vedic Sanskrit diverged into the upper-class classical Sanskrit and the regional vernacular Prakrits of the lower classes, reminiscent of the classical slash vulgar Latin split from number 5. A few centuries after the Maurya Empire fell, the Gupta Empire was founded by Chandragupta I, and India entered a golden age. Classical Hindu epics like the Mahabharata and the Ramayana were composed and the fields of math, science, and philosophy flourished. By the end of the Gupta Empire, the Prakrits had evolved into the predecessors of the modern Indic languages, and the spread of Islam stopped around here. A few centuries later, during the reign of the Delhi Sultanate, spoken Sanskrit went extinct and was primarily used as a liturgical language from then on. After the Delhi Sultanate came the Mughal Empire, and after the collapse of the Mughal Empire left India politically divided under the control of many states, the British were able to take advantage and conquer the whole subcontinent, establishing the British Raj, with the last straw of the British drafting Indians into the world wars. Rising unrest against British rule eventually resulted in the partition of the British Raj along religious lines and the establishment of the Republic of India. With the creation of the Indian constitution, Hindi, the language spoken in the capital at New Delhi, became the official standardized language of India and a lingua franca across the central Indic dialect area. Indic languages form a dialect continuum, so some languages are more understandable than others to different people. 800 million native speakers of Indian languages continue a history spanning about three and a half thousand years. So there you go, that's the top 5. If you speak any of the languages listed in this video, you are the next link in a chain lasting thousands of years, and there are not many things that have been around for that long. The countries these languages appeared in are gone, but they are not. Language is such an essential part about being human, and the fact that there are descendants of these ancient languages is a kind of preservation of the cultures that have spoken them throughout history. And to me at least, that's pretty cool. Alright, the video's over. Leave. Get out of here. Why are you still here? Leave. I said leave.